Airing first on Asheville FM, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Cherokee land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. I'll be sharing a conversation with activists from the Scuffletown Anti-Repression Committee and the Michigan Anti-Repression Committee, left legal defense groups from vastly geographically distant areas in the so-called U.S. They're talking about the case of repression in the so-called upstate, the northwestern part of South Carolina, in the southeastern U.S., where anti-racist and anti-fascist activists have been surveilled, intimidated, harassed, detained while naked at home, and arrested by local and federal law enforcement, including FBI, apparently on behalf of local white supremacists. You can learn more, keep up on the situation, and donate to their legal support at norepressionsc.home.blog. For the second segment, I had the chance to talk with Basil Soper, who is a writer, filmmaker, and a man of trans experience from the Appalachian region. He is the founder of the education and advocacy group Transilient, which seeks to uplift trans voices and trans experiences, and also to connect folks with resources from a place of relative safety and understanding. This group is seeking to undertake a documentary series in August, focusing on mental health resource access for trans people in Appalachia. They are in their very last push of fundraising currently, and if you would like to see more about this project and get in touch with them, you can go to wearetransilient.com and you can also email them at wearetransilient at gmail.com. And for those, transilient is spelled like resilient. In this interview, we got to talk about many different things about uh, about the social construct of Appalachia and where that might have originated, the people who actually live here, mental health concerns that trans people can face, plus many other topics. This interview was a really nice experience for me because I got to talk with another trans person from a working class rural background about things we both personally understand. On the other hand, so I had some technical difficulties which I was unaware of in the moment, the result of which some of my audio sounds a bit staticky. Okay, on to the interviews. If you're in the Asheville area, be aware that immigration officers were responsible for kidnapping four individuals in Henderson County to our south last week. They are changing their tactics to blend in better, sometimes using vehicles that look like work trucks with ladders on top, or mimicking the appearances of anti-ICE activists at times. If you'd like to get involved and join community resistance to ICE tearing apart our families and communities, consider checking out our show notes for a link to get involved or reach out to SEMA via their website and click the Get Involved tab. That's C-I-M-A-W-N-C dot org slash sanctuary hyphen W-N-C. A note on the words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain for this week and every week. Sean's segments are social commentary and critique and usually wrapped up in humor that should be considered satirical. If you have concerns about any of Sean's commentaries, consider writing him. His address will be at the end of the segment. Watch us say, watch us say! immigration regulatory system breaks down, and as the president considers busing detainees to the hometown of the House Speaker, I think I just may have hatched a plot for getting out of prison. I share now with you a letter that I've written to the President of the United States. I'm really sending this. No, really. So here goes. Dear Donald, before we get to the immediate business that is the reason for this letter, I must bring to your attention my firm conviction that you acted hastily and without justification when you fired Dennis Rodman during his season of Celebrity Apprentice. If you ever resume that show, I hope you give Dennis Rodman and comedian Tom Green another shot. Now, to the business that is the reason for this letter. My conscience has gotten the better of me, and I want to confess. In 1991, I stole the identity of an American named Sean Swain. I stole his identity so that I could sneak into your country and steal an American job. My real name is Jorge, and I came here from Guatemala. Just call me Guatemala Jorge. I joined up with a group of professional anarchists who gathered me up with a bunch of rapists and other bad hombres, and we came running across the border right where you plan to build a wall and make Mexico pay for it. 
I made my way to Ohio with thousands of other illegals so that we could register to vote and swing national elections to those pro-immigrant Democrats. I stole the identity of some random gringo named Sean Swain, who, it just so happens, was indicted for murder. Imagine my surprise when I finally learned English and discovered what had happened to me. So now, here I am in Virginia, without any criminal conviction or sentence in this state, and I don't even know what I'm doing here. I now write this letter because I think I've taken advantage of American taxpayers for far too long, getting free food and free clothing and free health care for 28 years, all benefits that some gringo named Sean Swain deserved. I feel bad continuing to receive all of these great benefits. I think it's time that you, President Trump, send me, Guatemala Jorge, back to my country of origin. I think that would only be fair and just. I have plans for my return. I intend to try out for the Guatemalan Olympic basketball team. I'm five foot ten. I might be the tallest Guatemalan in history. I could be a center or maybe a power forward. If the Guatemalan military doesn't shoot me at the airport to stop me from stepping on Guatemala City. You know, like Godzilla, because I'm so tall. I think deporting me after 28 years of me living off of the U.S. gravy train will send a clear and irrefutable message to those who don't take you seriously. Those who question your judgment in monumental matters, much more important than Dennis Rodman's and Tom Green's firings from your show. There's no rush, of course. I've been here illegally for almost three decades, so take your time. Please don't feel that you need to rush my deportation through the process and cut out the paperwork. The food here is fantastic, and I've joined a softball team. We've got cable, and a new season of Fear the Walking Dead just started. So, whenever you get around to it, please don't feel that my presence in your country somehow makes you look impotent or silly. Nobody is laughing at you behind your back because you got outsmarted by Guatemala Jorge, a.k.a. Sean Swain. Things like this take months or even years. Everyone knows that. In the meantime, as Sean Swain, I'm running for president. Don't worry, I'm not trying to steal any of your voters. I don't think any of your voters could possibly understand my platform. Instead, I'm trying to get the support of Russian hackers who can throw the election to me. You know, the Russian hackers whose support you didn't solicit. So, you won't mind if they work for me this time around. I think you should wait until after the 2020 election and see if a Guatemalan illegal posing as an American can win over Russian hackers and take your job from you. If you deport me before then, we'll never know if it was possible. Please also know that if you have a hard time arranging for a bus to Guatemala, or if the gas prices are too high, or if the system is just too overwhelmed with all of those kids you keep separating from their families and then killing, you don't really have to send me all the way back to Guatemala. Instead, you could bust me to one of those California sanctuary cities. That would really stick it to me and the Democrats if you dropped me off at Nancy Pelosi's house. Of course, given their track record, that's not much of a threat. When you tell Democrats you're going to dump migrants into their hometowns, they only think about how they'll save money by hiring cheap kitchen help. Still, it would be quite a symbolic victory if you dumped me on the curb outside of Nancy Pelosi's home. And I would send a clear message. I think I deserve that. Thank you for your time and kind consideration, and for all the free food, free housing, and free health care for all of these years. Sincerely, Guatemala Jorge, a.k.a. Sean Swain. So, yeah, that's what I'm sending to the orange bullfrog in the White House. Who knows? With any luck, those two fart goblins and army fatigues who drove me from Ohio to Virginia may show up and toss me in a van with a dozen urinal pitchers hitting the highway for the West Coast. Stranger things have happened, especially during the Trump presidency. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain, I mean Guatemala Jorge, in exile from Ohio at Buckingham Correctional in Dillwyn, Virginia. If you're volunteering for deportation, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at his latest address at 
Sean Swain, number 2015638, Buckingham Correctional, 1349 Correctional Center Road, Dillwyn, Virginia, 23936. You can find his past writings, recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org. So I'm speaking with members of Scuffletown Anti-Repression Committee and Michigan Anti-Repression Committee. Do you all want to introduce yourselves further or talk about the projects that you do? Sure. I'm part of Scuffletown Anti-Repression Committee, um, also known as STARC. It started off as a group of just supporters of um, J20 defendants in the winter, spring of 2017. And since then, we've branched out, obviously, because J20 is over now. But um, we've done presentations. We've given workshops on security culture and grand jury resistance and also a general anti-state repression training. Uh, and I'm Stephen. Uh, I'm a member of the Michigan Anti-Repression Committee. We're a group of legal workers and activists who are based in Detroit. We formed sort of as an ad hoc group uh, in April um, and around May of 2018. Um, and we formed in response to a series of FBI visits that were happening throughout southeastern Michigan. Shortly after a sort of large mass militant march against Richard Spencer uh, in Lansing. And since then, we've been releasing statements um, about the visits. And also we've done some Know Your Rights trainings, some panel presentations, and things like that. Today, we're going to be speaking about a situation in South Carolina where quite literally cops and Klan are walking hand in hand to harass, surveil, threaten, and undermine anti-racist organizers, facts that have recently been made public. Would you all give listeners some description of the upstate area and the activists being targeted and kind of of the scene there, like a thumbnail sketch? Sure. We're talking about pretty rural western South Carolina, small community, definitely a strong conservative base, which also means like there's a small liberal base. And um, from what I understand, the liberal organizing in that part of the state often works pretty closely with law enforcement, even going as so far as um, liberal groups or liberal individuals uh, calling the cops on some of the people affected by this case. So there are many people um, who are of interest uh, to the feds and the local police at this time. Um, If you read the statement that was put out like about a month ago, you'll see Uh, a bunch of people who are are all anonymous, um, but you can see how many people are being targeted right now in this case. Yeah, it seems like those are elements that would make organizing on the ground against fascist organizing all the more, not necessarily more pertinent because racism and racists exist in all like urban, suburban, rural areas around the so-called U.S., but, um, but especially the isolation, I'm sure, like, makes it especially hard to be doing that sort of work. On top of cultural and geographic isolation, a few of the people who are being investigated um, have have marginalized identities that makes them further vulnerable. Two folks in this case are queer single moms and another person is both trans and disabled. So occupying that space in addition um, to being like public either like through online or if you're going to protest as like anti-fascist and anti-racist does there's more vulnerabilities that these people are facing on april 24th when the second house was raided the both the questioning that this person got from the feds as well as um what sort of stuff was listed in the search warrant points to these folks specifically being targeted through state repression for identifying or maybe like engaging as anti-fascist and anti-racist. Would you all give us a timeline of the harassment and law enforcement activities in this case? All right, so I'll start in the fall of 2018. Um, A local known white supremacist went to someone's place of employment, demanding their personal information, and also making comments that alluded to an investigation that was currently going on. So sometime in the fall, between that visit by white supremacists 
in December 27, 2018. Um, that person's car was searched by local police, which is Greenville County Sheriff's Office, as well as the Joint Terrorism Task Force of the FBI. And something that's going to come up that was a little confusing for me to understand at first, there's actually an agent who works both as a sheriff and an agent of the FBI. So it's not just interdepartmental working. Like there's actually somebody who works in both departments. On December 27, 2018, uh, the first home was raided by local police and the FBI. This person was not arrested. However, they answered the door naked at the time, and they were handcuffed naked while um, many agents searched their home. The feds did try to talk to this individual while their home was being searched, and this is the first time that a federal agent references her personal relationship to the complaining witnesses who are two known white supremacists um, in this part of South Carolina. Um, she made a comment about being friends with these people. Um, and she'll later refer to that uh, at the second time a home is searched. Um, so while this person wasn't arrested, she was left handcuffed and naked at one point covered by a sheet with a bunch of strangers in her home. And um, she was not permitted to see the search warrant until they left. And then she found that the search warrant mentions conspiracy to violate civil rights. Okay, so then we go to 2019 in January. Three individuals received notices from Facebook that access to their accounts were granted to the police. In March 2019, FBI and local police confronted another person at work and tried to persuade them to uh, answer questions. In April 2019, Two more people received notice from Facebook that their accounts were granted to the police. And then on April 24, 2019, someone's home was raided. Uh, and this is the one person who has been arrested so far. Her house was raided by both FBI and the local police, and she was charged with felony first-degree harassment. What can you say about the, quote, witnesses, unquote? the law enforcement and FBI involved and their relationship with the neo-Nazis. So the complaining witnesses in the case um, are known um, Nazis uh, and friends of the Klan. They publicly identify as such. Outside of that, um, I don't know how much we, we know about them. Tanya Evanina is an FBI agent in South Carolina. Um, during the first house search, she let the person whose house is being searched, uh, this is the person who was in handcuffs while naked, Tanya identified herself as being a friend of the complaining witnesses, these white supremacists. And then the following April, when the other person who was arrested, when their house is being searched, Tanya asked a number of questions of this individual. And I'll direct quote her and say, what she said is, do I look like I'm friends with white supremacists? Which is kind of like bringing back an entirely different interaction that doesn't actually involve this person who was arrested. One question that I have is about three white men were parked outside of the house of the person who was arrested upon their arrival home out of jail. We don't know their identities or how they might have known to go to that person's house so a lot of, a lot of questions there you know i i don't know if these three white men if they got the information directly from maybe um a local law enforcement officer or the fbi or if maybe they got the information from the complaining witnesses either way the state is just acting in a totally unsurprising way of using like white supremacists in order to further target anti-fascists and anti-racists. And it reminds me of when very early on in the J20 case, a list of all the defendants was made available to some fascists who then started to dox people on the internet. Um, in that case, 
what was released was publicly available information. It just wasn't supposed to have been released so soon. And so folks were able to track the metadata back to somebody who worked for the Metropolitan Police Department. For listeners who may not know, can you briefly say what the J20 case was? The J20 case was a mass arrest of what started out as 230 folks uh, being kettled during an anti-capitalist, anti-fascist march in Washington, D.C. during Donald Trump's inauguration when we were released. After about 36 to 48 hours, we had one felony, a superseding indictment came about like a month and a half later that added like another six, seven, eight felonies to each person. And so while that was happening, folks were looking at like somewhere between 70 to 80 years um, behind bars. And I mentioned that case because there's overlap between using social media to target um, to target anti-fascists and anti-racists and anarchists, conspiracy charge. No one's been arrested for conspiracy in South Carolina as of right now, but that does seem to be of great interest to the FBI, and it's something that is mentioned in the search warrants. In terms of the question about the, the law enforcement and the FBI involved in the relationship, I think that's actually the more interesting question, and also there's a lot of unknowns there in terms of their actual relationship. What we do know is that the um, local law enforcement in this context, the sheriff in Greenville and the uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force are collaborating on this investigation. The Joint Terrorism Task Force was mentioned earlier in our conversation. And just a quick thing to note about the JTTF. The JTTF is a collaboration between local law enforcement and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The history of the JTTF is interesting just briefly because the first ever Joint Terrorism Task Force was convened in New York City in 1980, and it was specifically formed to investigate revolutionary left organizations and groups, for example, the Black Liberation Army, the Weather Underground, uh, and various groups um, involved in the Puerto Rican independence struggle. So just that context, I think, is worth noting here in terms of seeing sort of the larger, longer history of the role of these joint terrorism task forces uh, in investigating um, leftist, anti-fascist, revolutionary movements and organizations. So what we know from the documents that we have seen is that the JTTF uh, and the local police are working together on this case. The JTTF appears to be providing um, support in terms of surveillance, things like that. In addition to the surveillance um, and some of the other investigative work that we know that the JTTF has done in collaboration with the Greenville County Sheriff's Office, they also have been visiting local activists. They've been knocking on their doors, trying to get them to speak with them. That's interesting to me for a number of reasons. I mean, it's hard to say exactly what the relationship is between these two entities. Normally, there would be some sort of a document that would lay out exactly why they're working together and what context they do work together. And that's usually called a memorandum of understanding. But it is interesting that the FBI is playing um, such a large role in this investigation in terms of trying to contact witnesses or targets of the investigation, in addition to the surveillance and sort of sort of some of the background logistical support that they've been providing for the Greenville County Sheriff's Office. I think it raises a number of questions. Um, hopefully we can discuss those later in the show, but um, it is it is worth noting. I'd like to get back to social media surveillance in a moment, but first, can you tell listeners what appear to be the charges faced by those who got warrants and what follow-up, like court hearings, have come from these? Sure. So as of now, um, one person has been charged in this case with uh, felony harassment. I believe it's one count. And there is a court date on uh, June 27th. That's for a preliminary hearing. What can be said about the social media surveillance? There were warrants for some Facebook information noted in the online timeline. Is that usual? That was another overlap mentioned with J20, right? So in both cases, um, Facebook accounts were subpoenaed. In this case in South Carolina right now, five people's individual accounts have been subpoenaed. um, And the feds are also investigating the upstate area page or 
of State South Carolina Anti-Racist Action. They are looking at the owners of that page, but they're also interested in anybody who's ever liked the page or interacted with it, um, which, not to beat this very dead horse, but also in J20, the government was interested in the IP addresses of anybody who visited um, a disrupt J20 website. The person who was arrested was also told that the FBI was able to use not only her Google accounts, but also her Facebook account to geographically locate her at specific places at specific times. This is the Final Straw Radio, and I'm Bursts, and you're listening to an interview with two anti-repression activists talking about the situation of apparent police, FBI, and white supremacist collusion against anti-racist activists in upstate South Carolina. More on the case can be found at norepressionsc.home.blog. Just a heads up that when activists from Stark references A12, it's shorthand for the fight against white supremacists in the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia on August 12th, 2017. In addition to the overlap with the J20 case, there's also an overlap in terms of recent FBI investigations in Michigan. In the uh, spring of last year, the uh, FBI began doing a series of door knocks and visits with anti-fascists and other activists in mainly southeastern Michigan and sort of the metro Detroit area. And in one of those visits with an activist, they explained that they were monitoring a um, Facebook Messenger uh, page and Facebook Messenger traffic from a, uh, a leftist organization. They were on the actual the National Forum page and they referenced various messages they claimed um, they were concerned about. So it's a pretty common tactic that we're seeing in a variety of contexts. That's terrible and invasive as so much of the situation has proven to be. For listeners who are organizing over social media, do you have any tips on how to keep themselves and other activists safer on those platforms? From what I understand, there isn't any like organizing or planning uh, alleged to have happened through in any of these Facebook accounts. It's concerning, though, because so many people's accounts have been subpoenaed and there's still this like conspiracy investigation that hasn't had a charge yet that there's just so many questions about how social media is going to end up playing a role or not in this case. I personally love the internet and online communication because I am a disabled and queer anarchist. It helps connect me in so many ways um, that I don't have access to with my body sometimes. So I would like to like generally in the United States, like from what I've seen, I'd like to see a shift in social media being used from an organizing and more for proliferation of ideas or like building solidarity or like informing people rather than doing like any planning or organizing over these not secure platforms. Yeah, I really agree with that sentiment. In, in terms of tips, the Electronic Frontier Foundation does have some resources. They have a surveillance self-defense guide. Uh, and within that guide, they have a section about how to um, protect yourself on social networks. Some folks might find some of this stuff useful um, and helpful. The uh, website is ssd.edu eff.org. Again, that's ssd.eff.org. Um, and maybe you can flip through that and, and find some, some tools and tips that might be useful for you. I think it'd be useful for people to pay attention to exactly how social media accounts and direct message exchanges or posts will be used in court documents or in like court proceedings. I think about how during J20, the prosecution wanted a, an absurdly high number of IP addresses who visited the Disrupt J20 website. And so while visiting that website isn't a crime, the government was still looking at it in order to build a case for conspiracy to riot. With the current state ramping up white supremacy and repression of racialized populations and anti-racist activists, including white folks, do y'all see the situations in South Carolina, Michigan, and the J-20 case as a part of a federal trend? 
Um, this is really an excellent question, um, in part just because it gets at the idea that there might be some sort of a, a national trend. At least now we're seeing um, FBI involvement in terms of investigating anti-fascists in several different places. The cases all look kind of different, but there are some broad similarities, right? There, There is a similarity in terms of the use of social media and sort of the broad net that the FBI appears to be casting in the ways that they are trying to use social media to map both larger movements and then also to sort of look at specific charges. Yeah, I do think that those three cases you mentioned, I can think of a couple others as like testing grounds for either federal or state governments to try to prosecute anti-fascist and anti-racist. Right now, I'm thinking about anti-fascists who were physically injured by the A-12 attack and how the government, the like city or state government attempted to subpoena some of those folks for a grand jury. I think about how after A12, there were some arrests on the anti-fascist side, most notably like three black men who were all found guilty of something um, for defending themselves or defending their communities on A12. Yeah, I think the government no matter what level or what branch is trying to work out some stuff and figure out how they can prosecute people in new and different ways. Do y'all have any suggestions on how to build a proactive self-defense into our movements to like avoid being as reactive as having grand jury trainings after a grand jury has already started? Yeah, my first suggestion I would say is to um, do some some self-education, right? There are a tremendous amount of resources now that have come out over the last few years by various anti-repression groups, collectives. There's just been a whole ton of literature that's come out sort of since around Occupy and up to the present. It's all really been focusing on some of these questions in terms of a proactive self-defense and how to build anti-repression work into just regular movement work as an important aspect of any organizing. One resource that I really like came out a few years ago. It was put out by the Anti-Repression Committee in the Bay Area, and it's called Repress This, Ways to Be Your Own Anti-Repression Committee. Uh, I think this is a really helpful resource because it it forces a lot of these questions onto folks uh, in really helpful ways, but just trying to get people to think about how they can build anti-repression work strategies and and tactics into their own regular political organizing. You can find this zine at antirepressionbayarea.com. If you go into the library there on that page, you'll find this zine uh, there. I agree with everything that was just said. And in addition to that, I would like to see shifts in communities and networks about thinking security culture as this kind of like, this is what you do that's right, and this is what you do that's wrong. And I think security culture is more like a web of choices that are all about like mitigating risk and keeping each other safe. And someone really helped me understand this kind of work better recently by framing security culture and like anti-state repression efforts as the end goal being like, how do we get to a place where people feel supported and strong enough to not cooperate with the state rather than like simply just like, oh, you have to do all these things right in order to not get caught or like you have to do all these things right so that the state can't like use it against you later. So part of that is also relational security, which is something that I learned at the ABC conference two years ago. Um, not my not my phrasing, but when people feel respected, especially amongst like marginalized identities, when people feel respected and like held by each other, that's just as important part of security culture as like making sure your phone is encrypted. And the last thing I'll say is it would benefit us all if there was more of a culture of being like really open about security culture practices and not like gatekeeping information or creating a hierarchy of like someone's really good at security culture because they've been around for 10 years. It's really good if we can to like keep showing up to workshops because even if like someone has been doing 
this type of work for a long time, technology is still advancing. And so there's always going to be new stuff to learn. So shifting, shifting cultures around security culture from like a good and bad narrative to like a complicated web. What should someone do if they're contacted by law enforcement officers to keep themselves and their communities safer? Are there any activities like practicing in groups, phrases from know your rights trainings, role playing or studying together that folks are suggested to engage? The update from May 19, 2019 on blog. It's a good model about how to safely communicate a situation and also ask for solidarity. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that someone should do if they are contacted by um, law enforcement themselves is, you know, tell them that you're going to remain silent, ask them to give you a card and inform the agent, the officer, whomever, that a lawyer will contact them. And then, you know, you should contact a, uh, a local National Lawyers Guild chapter if you have one or uh, maybe an attorney that you know um, who'd be willing to help you out. And after that, I would really encourage you, like the, um, the folks did in the um, South Carolina case, to write down what happened, have an account of what happened. And then, you know, I think that you should share that experience. I think that's really the most important thing to do is to figure out a way that you feel comfortable with letting people know. I think that a public manner like the, um, the website or a statement is the best thing to do um, to alert as many people as possible. And then once you've done those things, yeah, I think it's important to start having conversations with family members, friends, partners, about the fact that there's been a visit from a law enforcement officer agent and um, to discuss you know, what your plan is going to be if that officer agent visits um, someone else, someone in your network, things like that. I really appreciate you all taking the time to chat and do this work. Is there anything that we forgot to cover that you want to say before we end this interview? A difficult part of this case is an allegation of animal cruelty made by the complaining witnesses um, in their affidavit. Uh, they allege that someone put dead animals in their yard. And while I'm personally not inclined to believe Nazis or the state, that is a difficult thing that's in there. And I just think that's a good like learning moment that sometimes people will be accused of really horrific things. Um, One thing I wanted to add before we end the interview is to just briefly talk about, I think, some of the wider implications of the um, this case in South Carolina and, and why I think it's important. The first thing I think I would just say is that, you know, the state, the FBI, police, they're always experimenting with different tactics in terms of how to bring cases, how to charge cases, different ways of repressing movements. Right. And so I think it's important to think about some of the wider implications in this case when we look at some of the more unique or interesting aspects of it that we've touched on, uh, like the role of the JTTF uh, and the FBI, the focus on social media, the fact that in some of the warrants and the the affidavits for the search warrants, they mentioned that they were thinking about um, or looking into conspiracy. It's just important to um, to think through some of those things and to think about the implications of them and to think about that in terms of some of the shifting tactics for uh, how to charge anti-fascists and leftists, right? Because it is possible, right, that the this case could become a federal case in some way. There's different ways that that could happen. And, you know, it's that's why I think it's important to look at the role of the FBI in this case. And then I also think it's important to look at the ways that the FBI recently tried to prosecute fascists, right? In this case, actually, the group RAM, this neo-Nazi crew based in Southern California. In, in, in that case, uh, in Southern California, the uh, federal government tried to charge those guys with um, violating the Riot Act, Federal Riot Act, and those charges were actually dismissed um, recently by the judge in that case because the lawyers for the defendants argued that, that those charges actually were unconstitutional. I mentioned that case just because it's an example of a moment where the federal government tried out a certain tactic to charge political activists, even though they're obviously not activists that we agree with, were against the fascists. But it was it was a moment where that that attempt to charge them with a crime failed. 
and their defense was that actually they were engaging in political activity. Now, we don't agree with that, but I, again, I just think it's important to show the different ways that the, the FBI, the federal government, is experimenting with and attempting to charge people in political cases. Going off of the thought about experimentation, I do think the success or failure of this case on the government's part will determine how they move forward with other anti-fascist, anti-racist, anarchist folks in the United States. And I've been thinking about how white people like myself, who have like community with like like-minded people, how can we share our resources or support or show solidarity to folks who live in more remote areas or don't have as wide of a community. And I think it can literally be as simple, even though we've talked a lot about the dangers of social media, it can be as simple as showing solidarity and support through social media. Um, In terms of support, uh, folks can visit the No Repression SC uh, website. It's no repression um, That contains the statement and then um, whatever current information there is about uh, the ongoing cases uh, and the current case. And then also um, there is a GoFundMe set up and that's linked um, on the statement on the website that I just mentioned. Uh, folks should feel free to donate there um, for uh, legal costs. To learn more about the work that Stark and Mark do, the two groups that provided the legal support for this uh, interview. You can check out Scuffletown Anti-Repression Committee at scuffletownarc.wordpress.com, as well as on various social media platforms. And you can also find the Michigan Anti-Repression Committee up at miantirepression.org. This is the Final Straw Radio, the Final Straw Radio.noblogs.org, and I'm Bursa Goodness. Would you introduce yourself for listeners and and tell people a little bit about yourself, if desired? Yeah, absolutely. Um, My name is Basil Soper. I'm a man of trans experience from the Southeast originally. I'm a writer and photographer, and I'm currently based in Chicago. Word. Would you speak about, so we're here to talk about an upcoming documentary series that you're uh, working on trying to get off the ground. Um, Would you speak about how you came to be doing sort of the kinds of activism that you're currently doing from a personal perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So this series is coming out of a like more umbrella project called Transilient that I started three years ago. And I had left Asheville, North Carolina, where I was living for about eight years and moved to New Orleans. And Shortly after I got there, HB2 passed, like in the middle of the night, the notorious bathroom bill and that you're well aware of. And I was just kind of in this headspace of really wanting to like push my limits and do something. I was feeling really overwhelmed and frustrated and didn't have a lot of community in New Orleans either, you know. Um, I was new there and I had been organizing for a long time in North Carolina but I decided to try to do this photo project where I would interview trans and non-binary people about pretty much anything they wanted to talk about, mostly outside of the transition or the physical and social transition that the media places such a strong emphasis on in order to kind of build connections, uh, not just for cis people to see trans people in a more human way, but for trans people to kind of see each other. I feel like there's a lot of fragmentation in terms of age, race, socioeconomics, political ideas. And I would just like folks to look at each other and see how beautiful they are and, you know, hear about their lives and their perspectives. So that started about three years ago. I've I've traveled the country three times doing that. Did about 150 interviews, mostly in rural areas. You know, I've been to like Wyoming, Mississippi, you know, but I've also been to like LA, you know, um, I went to school in New York. So... I just finished my bachelor's at the new school, so I did some, I've done some interviews in New York City. But, so the team that I've had join me over the years, I would take on different, like, folks who were from the Southeast, usually younger trans folks who didn't get a traditional education because I really didn't. I went to community college later in life in North Carolina to give folks the opportunity to have a platform and do this work 
So I'd take on different folks each year and some people would leave, you know, go on do other things. But my main team is based in Appalachia and Texas. So there's like someone who does a website and people who do like film work, which is a newer addition to the project. And we were just talking about Appalachia in general and love it. And also, you know, I had two friends um, commit suicide who were trans not living in Appalachia and the mental health struggles that a lot of us face and the lack of resources. And because I lived in New York and now live in Chicago, there's a huge difference between the ability to get HRT or a competent therapist. Um, while I think people are still like, you know, really oppressed in these areas, I think like it's like Medicaid covers your surgery and stuff in a lot of these areas. And like you can get a therapist that isn't going to be totally shitty and you don't have to go through, like letter process, you know, like you say to your parents, you don't want hormones, like you're going to get them and they're going to be like reasonably priced. So for me, that was a huge, crazy, like realization. Like I figured like everyone had to go through what people in the South go through uh, in order to get the hormones and to get mental health care. And so we just decided it was kind of time to really address the specific region because it was close to our hearts and to address these specific issues. That's really amazing. That sounds like a really like vitally needed form of education and form of, you know, uh, like resource and knowledge building. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like many of our listeners are trans and non-binary, so they might intimately know what you're talking about, but for any like Mm -hmm. cis folks who are listening, um, would you be willing to like speak a little bit on just from your own perspective, the kinds of like mental health Mm -hmm. issues that trans and non-binary people could face? Oh yeah, totally. Um, I believe that if you don't have access to support or other people like you, you're going to have some mental health things spring up. But then on top of that, if you can't get access to hormone therapy or surgery or things that some people might want, if they want to medically transition, that mental health issues will spring up. And then just the whole transition itself, like living in an oppressive society that's basically very cisgender oriented, that can make you feel you know, really depressed. So like you just need like some support, you know, and I think that then there's all the other crazy stuff that goes into like not being able to find work and like, you know, losing family members and the grieving process that you have to go through in order to transition in this society. And if you're in the South, there's like a whole extra added layer of, you know, the religious right being really extreme. And I think that it's just, I think it's just very understandable <laughs> that people, you know, face some pretty hard, Uh, mental health challenges because they have to like fight to survive every day and people in Appalachia and the trans and non-binary community there do a lot of work and have their own systems and their own communities but they shouldn't have to be doing that extra level of work to take care of each other that's just some of it yeah so uh you've spoken a little bit about it uh thus far but will you tell us a little bit more about the documentary series on trans mental health care in Appalachia. How was the idea? Well, well, you kind of talked about the idea for like how this kind of started, Mm. but would you talk a little bit about like sort of your hopes for filming this series and like maybe what you're like hoping to get out of it? Yeah. um, On a personal level, sorry, my cat keeps jumping up. (laughs) (laughs) On a personal level, I believe that it's just going to be really great to see that type of representation. And for and who are leading the project, they're both Kentucky born and raised. Um, you know, like it took to New York with me this winter to talk at a university, like he had never done an airplane. And so for them, I feel like they really have like the Appalachian roots and of you know, they live in Covington too. So that's like the town that's well known for the, MAGA kid who really upset the Native American person who was protesting and so like that's where they're from and I think for them it's going to be really great they're also young they're like 2021 and are kind of learning new skills in terms of creating film and being given responsibility and, and like support to do this and 
so for them, I think that's great. We also want to make a larger documentary, like a full length in the winter. So this is kind of a like learning process for them in a region that's really close to their heart, something that's really important to me, something that really needs to be done. So I think it's like a, a first way of opening doors to rural trans and, and queer people and also, you know, helping our organization kind of gain some skills and understandings before like moving forward to creating something bigger. That's really cool. I like the the thought of this as being like not only like a consciousness raising sort of effort, but also like an educational uh, process for the filmmakers. So that's really, really cool. Yeah. Would you talk about uh, the company Transilient or company? I don't know if it's a company or a group. Um, will you talk about Transilient and how this group like came to be and what its general sort of goals or aims are? Yeah, so we are at this time an advocacy group who I think we're going to probably move into 501c3 status. It's just been like kind of hard to do. I started it by myself the first year in 2016. And in 2017, I was like, I can't do this. Like the project, bigger. like, you know, I was doing social media, media outreach, photos interviews, driving, and it was tough. And the reason I did it by myself was that I like, took out a credit card and did it, you know? Like, I was like, how do I get other people on? I don't want to, like, ask people to volunteer for this type of thing or put their money towards it, you know? And so I got a sponsorship with uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality to do it in 2017 and brought two folks on. And then, like, they left... Celine got a new job in Brooklyn and then in 2018 I put a call out and I was like I can I think it's cool to like bring on people who don't have a traditional like background or any like quote professional um, experience in these ways and they are trans people who need to be talking to other trans people so I'm just going to continue doing that and continue trying to create space for folks who need it and last year the It Gets Better project sponsored that tour and then this year we're raising funds to do this small series the video series and then trying to get grants for the full film but it's basically just a place where if anyone wants to like come and learn and like offer skills and and wants to highlight trans lives and and get to meet people and connect people then i'll usually be like okay like you know like how can how can you be a part of this um, and right now I'm trying out to travel. I'm just like in charge of like trying to find funding. I would like to make a book out of the interviews that we've done. And I think in the long term, in a couple of years, it's going to take a while. We've talked about wanting to start a artist, like a trans artist residency in Tennessee or somewhere in like in the Appalachian area. Just bring in like it would be like sliding scale or like a lot of trans folks could come for free and have different trans people teach workshops and stuff. That's really amazing. Um, if people like are really curious and want to learn more about all the things that you just said, uh, is there a website or a spot that they should go to learn more information? Yeah, it's wearetransilient.com. Cool. Um, when is this, uh, is the tour hoping to happen? Mid August, I believe going to the Philadelphia trans, um, wellness conference in July it, and to make some extra connections and you know like just network a little bit more like face to face that sounds like a perfect jumping off point um <laughs> yeah um so uh Appalachia is a big place um and it's it's one which people think of in very specific ways like the construct of Appalachia is something that's very stereotypical would you speak about Appalachia as a region and who actually lives here? Oh, totally. Um, I think that, like any other part of the South, there are so many different communities and histories in each region, you know, and Appalachia is huge, you, you know, all the way up in, like, Virginia down to, like, Alabama. And that's so many different kinds of Southern states involved and, and different histories and different people that live there. And I think a lot of people have an idea that like even all Southerners are the same, right? Like I was just really angry and bigoted and not very smart. And, you know, that was another thing that surprised me leaving the South and moving to New York was 
people would like be like, oh, you're from the South, I couldn't tell. Or like, you don't sound like you're from the South or like, you seem too smart from, to be from the South. And I'm just like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's awful. Yeah. And I, I do think that there's a lot of working class folks, you know, in Appalachia. And there are a lot of different people of color and different communities of color that also exist. And I think that a lot of times people think about, you know, um, white rednecks just like owning the South and it's just a sprawl of Donald Trump hats. And, and there's a lot of that, but it's, it's not all of it. This is The Final Straw Radio and I'm William. We are talking with Basil Soper about access to mental health care in Appalachia, specifically for transgender people who live in this region. Um, how, how, like, I'm trying to think of a way to ask this question, because as, as somebody who's lived in Appalachia for pretty much all of my adult life, I've been also, like, coming up against, like, I, I grew up in northern Appalachia, which is, like, Rust Belt, kind of Pennsylvania, still along the Appalachian mountain chain, and then now I live in, in Asheville, which is, like, squarely in Appalachia, though some might, some might think otherwise. Why, I'm, I'm wondering about your opinion about, like, why these myths persist about Appalachia and, like, ways that you see people sort of, like, fighting against it. I imagine, and this is like a total like guess here, that some of the myths around Appalachia started in the Southeast by people in other Southern states who didn't agree with some of the choices that Appalachia made, especially during the Civil War. And, you know, like Western or no, Eastern Tennessee was like, you know, on the North side or whatever. And a lot of areas like in Tennessee post-Civil War were Like, the governor was really intense about, like, killing racists and stuff and was, like, really awesome about ending the KKK. And I think that upset a lot of other people. I don't think he was very successful either, but I think that it gave other people who were just really angry the ability to create some rumors about Appalachians and then, for whatever reason, that, like, bled over. And I'm not sure why it's the visual that's given for Southern folks is sometimes those are folks who are like quote up in the hills, you know, or like hillbillies when there's, there's so much other parts of the South. But I I think it's like some internal stuff that happened in the South originally. Yeah. That's a super interesting hot take. Thank you uh, for going there. So you've, you you mentioned this a little bit before and uh, like the diversity in Appalachia or, you know, so, you know, so-called diversity in Appalachia and as it pertains to like mental health care specifically, a lot has been said about like when POC interface with the mental health care industry mm-hmm. and it being uh, another layer of added troubles that folks usually generally mm-hmm. face. Will, do you know about like, will this doc series take on this topic and would you speak about this issue from your perspective? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is something that's really important for us to highlight and cover. And we're trying to start gathering um like names of people who might be interested in talking to us and have this type of experience. I don't have this experience firsthand, but I do think that there are so many extra layers of struggles and obstacles to being a person of color in the South, let alone a person of color who's also trans in Appalachia that I can't even begin to imagine, you know, from my my firsthand experience. But I, I also know that it's hard because I am something I, I noticed when I lived down there was that there's a lot of talk from like white queer folks and trans folks about wanting to be more inclusive and yet it just still wasn't very inclusive. So it was hard to give people um, space to resources and access. So I would like to hear some people talk about that, like their troubles with like even getting into communities where it's a little bit, quote, safer and, you know, what they face in the the healthcare system and at home. Because I don't, you know, I don't have the same like upbringing. Yeah, definitely. And like if, yeah, I think that the, um, the question of, sort of, I, I don't want to say white supremacy, but maybe like white exceptionalism in queer spaces is super, super, super real. And 
Yeah, yeah. Even gaining access to the like very limited power that is in like white queer spaces is is a definite huge mm-hmm. issue. Um, if anybody who's listening is like sparked by what you're saying, if they um, are interested in getting in touch to like be interviewed or they know somebody who might be willing to be interviewed, how can they like get in touch with y'all? We have a Google form sign up sheet on our website at wearetransilient.com and people can just sign up. You can also, if you want to personally email us, you can email us at wearetransilient at gmail.com if that's more comfortable for somebody. Really just me and one other person who read those emails. So it's not like public knowledge. Yeah, and I would I would love feedback on that and I would love to try to make that aspect of it really visible and important. Is there any other are there any other words that you have on this topic? Yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot lately, especially with the murders in Texas, like with Malaysia and uh, Brittany White, and even in Detroit um, recently. And I just really want to be able to, I think that everyone is kind of on the same side, right? Like a lot of trans and non-binary people are like, we need to help, you know, trans people of color, but we don't really know how. And I would like to also just hear feedback on how people would want us to help not how we think we should help, you know, um, or what we think we're doing is helping because it just might not be. And and I would like to know how exactly, like what could we do in the future and just try to like really make that really clear. Yeah, I was like talking to, this is maybe something that I'll like cut out, but I was talking to um, people from the Indigenous Anarchist Federation mm-hmm. uh, the other day and they were like, there is no liberation for people when like these when our like siblings are being murdered by people or being like slowly murdered by like uh, systems that are keeping people impoverished or keeping people endangered, Mm -hmm. I guess. So I'm like, yeah, I like as somebody who is like kind of nominally, like I'm, I'm the kid of an immigrant. I'm sort of maybe kind of Brown. I I, I sort of feel like we're all uh, working toward a similar goal of, of, certain things like not being something that affect people's lives so much so yeah thank you for having that like perspective and that lens and um for um having that sensitivity when moving forward with this doc series um something i'm really interested in and will like definitely be looking forward to like seeing in the future um yeah definitely let's see i had a couple more questions or one more question um, so you are at the end of a big fundraising push for a tour around Appalachia. Um, will you talk about how people can help support uh, this fundraising effort or like other ways that they can help support? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did a goal of $7,600, which will cover to drive around and bring an assistant. And we're trying to get specifically a trans person of color who has like a little bit of a film background to join and be paid. So like that money is going to go towards you know, them as well and some like camera equipment that they might need. And we've been, so we're about $2,000 shy now with 10 days left, which is pretty good. I was really worried there for a while. And that's on Kickstarter. It's also on our website. And if people, you know, want to help in any other way, like it's really helpful if people know people in certain cities where we're going who might let them like, crash on a couch or you know want to send us like five bucks through Venmo or just even spread the word about it you know making it more well known I think is going to be a really helpful thing for them I think for them going to different cities the more people they know there the easier it's going to be to find people to talk to and doctors to meet and like things of that nature. That's awesome I know that like I've been talking about it around Asheville and just by virtue of being trans, I'm friends with a lot of trans people who are also in healthcare, and they're like, wait, what, do, do they want to be friends with us? Um, do we already know people? Do we already know these folks who are doing this doc series? So I know, like, personally, there's a lot of, like, interest around Asheville yes. from, like, folks in the trans community. How can people, like, hear or see the... So you mentioned that you did a bunch of interviews in the beginning of of this chat 
Um, if people are interested in finding out or seeing those those things, are they on the We Are Transilient website? Yeah, they're on our website and they're also on our Instagram, um, which is kind of a crazy place right now. So if you want like, <laughs> always, <laughs> it's always your crazy. Gallery, like you know, check out check out the website. It, it's it's been very cool, um, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done so far. Um, Basil, that's all the questions that I had. Is there anything that we missed that you'd like to give voice to or any sort of parting words that you'd like to leave listeners with? Um, I'm just really glad that we got to connect and, and, you know, I'm looking forward to connecting with more folks and that's like my favorite part of this work. So it was just nice talking to you. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it was a pleasure and thank you for taking time out of your day, even though like you're not feeling well. It was really lovely to get to chat. Thank and um, <laughs> I, pre- I appreciate your energy and your time. Thanks for listening to our interview with Basil Soper, founder of the education and advocacy group Transilient, about their upcoming documentary tour in Appalachia, focusing on mental health resource access for trans folks living in this region. To learn more about this project and for ways to get involved or donate, you can visit wearetransilient.com and email them at wearetransilient at gmail.com. And that is spelled T-R-A-N-S-I-L-I-E-N-T. Hello, awesome listeners. It's been a bit since we've put in a donation request at y'all, but here is one. We talked in our nine-year anniversary about what support can look like and have gotten awesome suggestions and offers of help that we really appreciate. In case you're a listener out there who has some extra money that you want to support us with, we will gladly take it. William and I spend hours every week researching topics, contacting guests, recording, and editing Oftentimes, those interviews don't even happen. Also, as another example of the work we do, I recently recorded hours of audio from the North American Anarchist Studies Network conference in Atlanta that I'm working through editing to share with y'all. That trip was out of pocket, and I personally got a lot out of it, but it'd be lovely to get some gas money covered. To that end, we have a link on our support slash merch page on the website, that includes links to web stores where you can find t-shirts, buttons, and stickers, the proceeds of which help us, hopefully, to afford to travel and bring you voices that you may have missed. There you can also find a link to our Patreon where you can make recurring monthly donations as little of as little as a dollar, and with higher amounts having rewards attached, including on-request transcription of an interview or a mixtape designed by the co-hosts. Also, there's a few new PDFs of zine versions of some of our interviews up on our site that are searchable by the term zine that you should check out, print out, spread around. Thanks so much. This is The Final Straw, and I'm William Goodenough. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions or suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat underground and independent literature. You can find a sample of Firestorm's catalog of books and zines plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.com.